You know, the book of Ephesians is uh, a little bit like a vitamin pill. You may not have thought of it like a vitamin pill before, but it really is. Because, you know, the whole thing about taking supplements is that in a tiny little capsule, you have so much packed in there that you need, uh, you know, that, that your body requires. And the idea is by taking one or two capsules, maybe you can get your vitamin C or whatever it is that you're deficient on back up to where it needs to be. And the book of Ephesians is like that. Actually, it's a tiny portion of the whole of the scripture that we've got. And yet there is so much contained within this. Um, uh, so much good teaching, um, uh, deep theology that's in there, the study of God, understanding him. And ecclesiology as well, how we understand the church. Uh, and so it's, it's all packed in there. And we've said uh, in our earlier studies, let me just remind you again, that uh, it neatly falls into two halves. You've got the first half, chapters 1 to 3, uh, which is, this is the kind of, um, I'm going to call it theoretical. Um, I think it's deeper than theory, actually. I think there is some practicality to it. Um, but it's real theology in that, that first half. And when you come to the second half, we come on to practicality, how we apply this and how we work it out. So I'm making no apologies for the fact that the first three chapters are going to be the hardest. Um, and, I, uh, you know, we've still got a long way to go uh, through these first three chapters. But, you know, the, these are uh, the things where we need to try to get ahead around uh, the teaching that Paul had received uh, on uh, how to understand God and how to understand the church. And then we'll move on later on to, now what do we do with that? Um, how do we apply it to our lives? So let's read uh, from Ephesians 1, um, verses 3 to 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who worked out, works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Well, may God bless his word to us this morning as we, we continue uh, to work our way through. Um, I'm not going to recap everything that I've said <clears throat> uh, in the previous weeks um, for obvious reasons that it would just take too long and what have you. But let me just, just highlight one or two things, um, particularly from last week. Because last week we, we kind of left the first uh, couple of verses behind and, and, and started to move on. Um, uh, into to verse 3, and particularly we, we focused on verses 3 and 4 uh, last week and, and into verse 5. And here we saw uh, this uh, very difficult doctrine of election. Uh, and we said that it was one of those doctrines that, that there's a great divide and differences of opinion on, on how it works and uh, what we should believe on it. But essentially... Um, what we're also saying is that nobody really understands the doctrine of election. I mean, we know it, but we don't understand how it works. How is it possible 
that God chose you before the creation of the world to bring him glory, to be his, and that once he chose you, he was never going to let go of you, and that he predetermined that you would put your faith and your trust in him. And at the same time, you have 100% free will. And that's one of those mysteries that we can't understand. And God is full of mysteries. How is Jesus 100% God and still 100% man? You know? I mean, it's, it's difficult. Difficult to explain. How does the Trinity work? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How are they all one and yet three individual persons? I, I don't understand that. You see, and Scripture is full of these things that... In this life, we will never fully understand. But it's important because um, uh, that we try and get our heads around it. And more important than anything else is not so much saying, hey, now I have a mental understanding of this particular area of, of teaching, of doctrine. But it's about faith. It's about belief. It's about saying, if God says it, it must be true even if I don't understand it. And the mistake that we often make is that when we don't understand something, we try and explain it away, rather than facing up to the fact, this is way beyond me. Scripture tells us that his, his thoughts are higher than mine, his ways are higher than mine. You will never fully understand God. And so somehow, somehow God has looked upon uh, the people of this earth from beginning to end, and right from the beginning, he could see the distant future. And he knew every single person that is going to be given life from the beginning of time right to the end when he comes back. He knows every single one who will believe in him. And it tells us in Revelation that we read that even before the beginning of time, he wrote their names in the book of life. That's how confident he is. He knows. Thankfully, I don't know. I have no idea who he has called and who he has not called. And therefore, I preach to everyone as though it could be you, that you might be the one, in the hope and the prayer that indeed that the Lord has poured his grace and his mercy upon your life. Now, as we move on, I want to concentrate today uh, more or less particularly on verses 7 and 8. Um, I know we've kind of skipped a little bit in verse 6, but we're going to come to that um, too uh, a little bit later. But here in verses 7 and 8, let me just read these verses to you. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. <clears throat> Now, don't forget that what we're looking at here is the, the fact that uh, earlier on in verse 3, he spoke about us having every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. And we looked at that and we said, we, we picked out seven spiritual blessings uh, that, that he speaks about here in these verses, uh, in, in 3 to 14. And we're gradually working our way through these blessings that God has poured out um, upon his people. And so as we move on, we're going to start looking at the blessings today, two of them, hopefully anyway. Um, first of all, redemption through the blood of Christ. And secondly, the forgiveness of sins. Now, obviously, these are linked together in such a way that you could never tear them apart. Um, but at the same time, uh, there are distinctions between these blessings. So let's deal with them one at a time and um, see how we get on. I want to look at, first of all then, he tells us that in him, in Christ that is, we have redemption through his blood. That's the blood of Jesus. We did touch on the fact of what redemption is last week, and we, we said it's not a word that you hear very often unless uh, you're into uh, you know, um, uh, shopping vouchers and things like that, where you take it in to be redeemed. Um, and, but other than that, you know, we don't tend to use the word redemption very much in everyday use. 
Yet the word uh, here for redemption is uh, uh, it's a word that was uh, quite common in Bible times uh, and uh, it literally meant to buy out of the market. That is the word, to buy out of the market. It's to go to the market and purchase something. And in this particular case, <clears throat> what it's talking about here is not just any market, <clears throat> it's talking about the slave market. And it has a particular reference to buying human slaves. That might make you feel uncomfortable. I hope it does. It is meant to. The Bible is a shocking book. You may have discovered that by now. It is full of all kinds of things that are very un-PC. That's why there are various groups uh, who are trying to get at least bits of the Bible uh, written out or banned or whatever in, in certain in places and circles. It's on PC. But again, there is no apology for that. It's meant to be. And when it talks about buying people out of the slave market, that is not saying that it condones slavery, human slavery, by any means. Quite the opposite, actually. But what it is talking about, though, is the fact that we cannot ignore that humans are already in a form of slavery. Slavery is taboo, isn't it? And <clears throat> we know perhaps of historical slaveries, but slavery still exists today. The slavery has shifted very much, and it's very much today uh, uh, tends to be, uh, you know, in, in the sex industry where particularly uh, young women uh, from various parts of the world, but certainly here in the UK, we're seeing it from Eastern Europe, who are being brought into the country essentially as slaves. It's a human slavery. And I hope that it you know, absolutely appalls you to think that's even going on. And it should appall you, because you as a human being, are meant to be free. You're not supposed to have shackles upon you. You're supposed to be a free person. And yet the thing that we find is that every human being is a slave to something. And particularly, we're slaves to sin. And we can prove that we can prove that very easily because most of us have an idea of what sin is, the difference between right and wrong. And the thing is that when human beings try to be good of their own accord, they always fall down. They always end up going back into sin again. You see, sin has this grip upon you. And it gives you a certain amount of freedom, and you can move around in it. And you might even think to yourself, hey, I am free. <clears throat> you know, there is nothing that is actually holding me until you start to step over the line. And it's then as though this, this chain suddenly tightens, and you're pulled back, and you realize that you weren't as free as you thought you were. And sin says, you see, I've got you. I've got you. And you can't break free from it. Now, this is why Jesus came. Jesus came and he said that I have come, that you might have life and life in all its fullness. He said, I have come to set the captives free. He said, I have come that you might... Uh, uh, be free and he says if whoever the sun sets free is free indeed total freedom so those who come to Christ those who ha can put their faith and their trust in him somehow or other which we're going to explore somehow or other <clears throat> they are being released from these shackles that are holding us firm how does that work 
Well, I want you to now think about this slave market. And in Roman times, say slaves were common. Um, Paul is writing to uh, the Ephesians, and as we discussed uh, in earlier studies on this, that it's, it's a wider group too in the, the uh, Asia Minor region. But Ephesus was a big city. It had several hundred thousand people in its population. But it's estimated that a huge percentage of those were slaves. So they understood about slavery. <clears throat> Where did the slaves come from? Usually from overseas territories. Uh, the, the Romans used to go out, they would conquer, um, and they would bring back captives. They would bring them back and they would sell them on. And before you know it, you've got all of these people, uh, foreigners being brought in to uh, the Roman colonies as slaves. That was the, the common way of doing it. Now just suppose that you as a, a wealthy person, you may not be a wealthy person, pretend you are for the moment. You're as a, a wealthy person and as you walk along the, the line of these shackled slaves, eyeing them up and down thinking, you know, which one shall I pick, which one shall I have? And you agree a price. We know that in Bible times, the, the standard price for a slave was 30 pieces of silver. But suppose that that which actually is not very much, 30 pieces of silver was very little money actually. That's how cheap the life can be. And so you're able to go along and you're able to, to pay for a slave. So you pick the best that you can find. And you take them and, and you can work them then in your own service if you want to. You can treat them exactly as you choose. They're your property. They have no rights of their own. That's what redeeming is all about. And Jesus has come into the slave market. And he's walked along and he's picked. And it says it's nothing to do with us actually. This is the difference between him and, and uh, the wealthy people of the day who were looking for the slaves. What do they do when they look for the slaves? They're looking for, I want somebody who's going to be strong enough to work in my fields or whatever it might be. But Jesus doesn't look at it like that. It says that he picks for his own pleasure and will, for his own purpose. He has no particular agenda except to glorify his father. And he handpicks, he says, I'll have that one, and I'll have that one, and I'll have this one. And when he buys you out of the slave market, actually, that doesn't give you freedom. You are not actually being set free at that point. In fact, what's happened is you've come out from the slave market into the slavery of Jesus. Jesus. But look, here's the good news. You see, when a master bought his slave, <clears throat> he had the opportunity then. He could do anything. He could treat them very badly. He could even murder them if he wanted to. It wouldn't mean called murder. It was just killing them. It's his property. Do whatever he likes with them. Or he could, if he wanted to, Say, so here you are, here's your freedom. Go, you're a free person. You go and do whatever you like. You're not in my service anymore. And release them. And some people think that when Jesus buys out of the slave market, that he then releases them. But that's not what scripture teaches. That we are now slaves to righteousness, Romans tells us. So no longer can we go, because actually what will happen if Jesus set you free to do your own thing and that he completely had no hold on you whatsoever is that you will be captured again by sin. And before you know it, you're back into slavery. So Jesus buys us out of the slave market and then he says, this is what I'm going to do. First of all, 
He's a righteous and fair master. He will not do anything to mistreat you. You're in his service. So your life is not your own. So we act in obedience to him. But the wonderful thing is that when we're in his household, he says, you know, I'm giving you so much freedom to do as you choose, but let me set some boundaries. Here are the boundaries of the Christian life. This is what I expect of people who belong to me. But, you know, he takes that even further. Because he doesn't really put us in chains or anything like that. So in that sense, we do have a certain amount of freedom. But he says, when you start to experience this freedom, you're not going to resent it. You're going to love it. You're going to say that in this slavery to righteousness, I've never felt so free. Never been so free before. Because you see, when he sets down the boundaries, it's always for our own good and for our own protection. And to bring glory to his name, of course. It's never to do you harm. Never to see you fall and falter. Therefore, it builds you up. It encourages you. It strengthens you. It makes you into a better person. And so he redeems us, but he does it through the blood. You see, the thing is that when he came to the slave market, I said a slave was 30 pieces of silver. That was the going rate for a slave. But you see, there's, a, there's an issue here. Because actually, although the going rate is 30 pieces of silver, what if, what if the slave trader said, ah, today the price has changed. Today it's not 30 pieces of silver. Today I'm going to ask for more. I'm going to ask for 40 pieces of silver. See, the price can vary. Do you remember when Joseph was sold uh, as a slave by his brothers? This is interesting, isn't it? By his own brothers, he was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Can you imagine that? That's how little they thought of him. 20 pieces. Now, why did they sell him at that price? Was that their own guilt, that they didn't want to take 30? Or was it that the traders said, ha, He's not worth even 30. And they were so desperate to get rid of him. But suppose it goes the other way. Suppose the slave trader says to Jesus, you can't have him or her for 30 pieces. I want 40. Would Jesus pay the price? Well, that depends how desperately Jesus wants you. So what's going to push the price up? Is it going to be how good you are? Is the slave trader going to look at you and say, you know, this one is so good, if you're going to have this one, then it's definitely 40. And Jesus looks at the next one and says, what about this one? That one, even better, 50. Is Jesus going to say, well, I'll take the one for 40 then, rather than the 50. Is he going to say that? Look, let me tell you, the slave trader is so unscrupulous that the slave trader has said this. It's not 30 pieces of silver. It's not 40. It's not even 50. It's not even 100. I want blood. It's got to be a life. If you want to save this life, you have to exchange it for a life. That's how unscrupulous the slave master called sin is. Therefore, Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. That's what it's going to cost. It's death. And Jesus said, okay, what blood? What blood can possibly purchase somebody? You see, the problem we have here is this, that everybody is in the slave market. 
Everybody has been held by sin. Therefore, we need somebody who is already outside of that slavery, who is able to pay the penalty, the asking price, which is one life, a perfect life, because it's the only way. And the problem is because everybody's already bound by sin, nobody is free to give that price that's being asked. So God looks at the situation and he says there is only one way to get around this. It has to be the one perfect human being who is not a slave to sin. He is the only one who can possibly pay the price that is being asked. And Jesus gave his life. He bought us with his own blood. And having given up that life, sacrificed upon the cross now now the price has been paid but jesus says not for one but i'm paying for every single one that i will take everyone is covered by the blood of jesus so that's the good news the price is paid the debt is cancelled and he buys us out of the slave market We come into him where we get the freedom. But look, it doesn't stop there, because look how it goes on. It tells us that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You see, the thing is that we are sinners. That's why we're in the slave market. We're slaves to sin. We're sinners. And I know some of us think that we're good, But it doesn't take much to prove that we're not good. I was watching uh, on YouTube recently uh, an evangelist at work. I think he's uh, he's a one-off, I have to say it. But he's brilliant how he goes about it. And so he goes up to a person, and I've watched him do this several times, and he enters into a one-to-one conversation. And the person's objecting to him, and the message that he's bringing that they need Jesus. So he says to him, tell me, he says, do you consider yourself to be a good person? Yes, I do. Well, that's great. You do lots of good things. Yes, I do. You're nice to the people around you. Yes, I am. Well, that's great. Do you think you're good enough then that, that God should just let you into heaven? Yes, I do. How perfect do you think God is? Well, he's really perfect. Faultless? Yes, faultless. Do you think, therefore, that he should allow people who are not at his standards to come into his presence? Mm, Well, not sure. Let me ask you some questions. Have you ever told a lie? Of course I have. What do we call people who tell lies? A liar. Okay. Have you ever taken anything that doesn't belong to you? Well, yeah, I guess I have. What do we call people who steal? A thief. So by your own admission, you're a lying thief. (laughs) And you think you're a good person. Why should God let you in? Why should God have lying thieves in heaven? Yeah? You know, and this, you can see how it goes. And he'll take them down this road, several steps, until he's painted a completely black picture of them. You see, because by our own standards, we think we're okay. But by God's standards, we're not. So God has bought us by the blood of Jesus. He's brought us out of the slave market. But then we've got to deal with the sin. How can God forgive that sin? Because if we're going to go into his presence, into his household, into his service, we've got to be cleansed of that. But you know, the wonderful thing is that when you come to Christ, not through your own strength, but through his, the power of sin is broken. It doesn't mean to say you will stop sinning overnight, although I hope that as 
the process continues of making you more like Jesus, that perhaps you'll do less and less things that are dishonoring to him and more and more that are glorifying to him. But as you go down that road, that's what we call sanctification. We have to remember that, that that's an ongoing process, but there has to be a point of something we call justification first. And that happens in an instant, unlike being made like him, sanctification, which is a process which takes a whole of a lifetime, justification happens in an instant. And we are guilty sinners. And what the Lord says is this. He says, you might be a guilty sinner, but because Jesus stood in your place, the debt, the penalty has been paid. You see, his blood did not just pay for your sin, but it actually did something about washing it away, getting rid of it, getting rid of the guilt, that is, of it. Because Jesus became an offering to God, a guilt offering that paid for the sin, a sin offering that, that dealt with that, that satisfied everything that God demanded. That doesn't make you a perfect person. It doesn't mean that you, you, you no longer do anything wrong. What it means now is that in your position in Christ, you have been covered or clothed with new garments, his righteousness. And as you put on those garments of his righteousness, all of your stains that covered you have been covered over. No longer does God see those. He says, now you're in Christ. Now it's okay. It's acceptable for you to come into my presence. I will not hold you accountable anymore for your sins. Jesus has dealt with that. That's the wonderful thing, the truth that's coming through here. And so as we build on these blessings that come, that God picks us, he calls us, he predestines us, and then he sees it through. So when he calls us, he then justifies us, and then he sanctifies us, and then he glorifies us. So you see that he who began a good work in you, Philippians says, will carry it on until completion, until the day of Christ. He never stops working on you. Never stops. And the wonderful news is that it's so simple to actually receive from him. So simple. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sin? Do you actually believe with all your heart that he went to the cross so that you didn't have to pay your own penalty? See, the thing is that you haven't got enough in the bank. And I haven't got enough in the bank. And even if we all club together, we haven't got enough in the bank to pay the price that's being asked. But Jesus did. How come? Because it says he did it out of his glorious riches. How rich is he? Infinitely rich. His grace extends, therefore, over and over and over. I love the word that it uses here, lavished. It means to pour grace upon grace upon grace. He doesn't just stop and say, do you know, I think you've had enough grace from me. I think I've forgiven you enough. You see, and that's one of the problems that so many of us wrestle with. We kind of look at it and we say, you know, I'm too bad for God to forgive. What you need is his grace. Okay, I receive his grace. Therefore, I'm forgiven. I don't deserve to be. And that's what grace is all about. It's, it's receiving something that you've not worked for, earned, or deserve. And God says, I pour upon you forgiveness. And you receive that. And then you look at your life again. You say, but you know, I continue to do things are wrong. Therefore, I don't deserve that. And God says, I'm going to pour more grace onto you. More forgiveness. More undeserved favor. I pour it upon you. Somebody might look at their past life and say, you know, I wasn't just an average sinner. I mean, I did some of the most terrible things you could possibly dream up. Could God possibly forgive me for that? Yes, he can. 
Yes, he can. Because he lavishes his grace upon you, pouring it grace upon grace upon grace. You see, you cannot exhaust God's riches. You might try, and perhaps some of you have, but you find that he's still got more. That doesn't give us license to go and do as we please. It doesn't mean that we can go off and just carry on sinning and just knowing that God's grace is, is there because that would actually prove that you never received his grace in the first place, if that's your attitude. So you have a complete change of heart and mind when you come to Christ. You no longer want to do the things that harm him or hurt him and upset him. You want to only do the things that please him. And that when you do find yourself straying into those areas that are dishonoring to him, it's going to cause you to grieve. It's going to cause you to say, I am so sorry that I did that. I didn't want to do it. I mean, sin is a powerful thing still. It is powerful. Temptation comes upon us all. But the point is, no matter what that temptation is, that you can fight against it. I know we're weak. I know we fall, but you can fight against it. And you can overcome it. There is no temptation that is put before you that is too great. So, as Paul builds on his argument here, and as we look at it, here in chapter 1, we've been bought at a costly price. We belong to him. He's now our new master. He's given us freedom to do so much, so much, but he set some boundaries and said, do not cross. When we do cross, there's still more grace because when you cross it, you're going to come back again. If you truly belong to him, if you cross his boundaries, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt you. You're going to say, I don't want to do that. I want to turn back to him. And as you do that, you will find that your sins forgiven, past, present, future, every single one of them dealt with at the cross of Jesus. Every single one. And that what you discover is that more and more and more is that you are finding the grace of God is sufficient. More grace, more grace, more grace. Isn't that wonderful? That you are experiencing his riches. That when you are bankrupt, he says, let me fill your account again. How I wish somebody would fill my account when I run out. Yeah? But that's what he does. Just more and more and more. That you can never be outside of his grace, his mercy, his love, his will, if you belong to him. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads for a moment.